Santa Ana Rent Control Explained. This is a guide for tenants and landlords on Santa Ana's two newest ordinances. We have the Rent Stabilization Ordinance and the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance, and they went into law on November 19th, 2021. We're gonna run through what properties are exempt and covered by these ordinances. We're gonna cover the notices that are required for landlords to give their tenants in Santa Ana. And we're gonna discuss some of the highlights of both of the ordinances. Hey there, Christian Walsh, real estate agent with Wire Associates. We've been helping tenants and landlords and buyers and sellers navigate these crazy days in California and beyond. And just as we've done for the eviction moratorium laws and just as we've done for AB 1482, we're going to dive into Santa Ana's newest ordinances. And remember, we can't give tax or legal advice, but for the most honest and up-to-date real estate advice, subscribe to this channel. The state of California already has legislation in place that covers rent increase caps and just cause evictions. It's called AB 1482. But what Santa Ana has passed is more strict than the statewide law. That means that these must be followed in Santa Ana. And throughout this, you'll hear where we mention some of the differences between AB 1482 and Santa Ana's laws. In the description below, we've included links to the full ordinances for both rent stabilization and the just cause eviction. We also have links to the notices, plus other resources from the city. I encourage all Santa Ana tenants and landlords to read through the ordinances and take a look at the language to see exactly what it says. First, we'll talk about what properties are exempt from both of the ordinances, and it mirrors closely AB 1482 and the properties that are exempt from that. If a property has been issued a certificate of occupancy in the past 15 years, then it is exempt. And we're gonna cover this in a section coming up where we show the dates and break it down. If it's a dormitory, if it's deed-restricted affordable housing, it's exempt. But the bigger category is single family homes, condos, and townhomes that are not owned by a corporation or an LLC. Those are exempt from both of these ordinances. And this is a big portion of the rental properties in Santa Ana. But don't leave just yet, landlords, because there's important language you will have to give to your tenants in order to maintain this exemption, and we're gonna go through that. One other category that would also be included in this is duplexes that are owner occupied in one of the units, but anything else, duplexes that are tenant occupied or bigger, 100 units, four, three, those are all subject to these regulations. You may need to run through this section a few times because it can get a little bit confusing, but just go ahead and hit rewind and you can watch it again. So these are properties that on the face of it are not exempt from AB 1482 and they're not exempt from Santa Ana's ordinances. So these would not be single family homes, ta condos, townhomes. Those are exempt. This would be multifamily if the building received its certificate of occupancy anytime between today and 15 years ago, it is exempt from both the state AB 1482 and it is exempt from Santa Ana's ordinances. But this is a rolling calendar. So as time continues to move forward, that 15 years will also move forward at the exact same time. So bear that in mind. While the property may be brand new now, in 15 years, it could be subject to these ordinances, both at the state or local level. So that's a rolling timeline change. Once a property hits a 15 year old mark, it is now subject to two different things. So it is subject to Santa Ana's Just Cause Eviction Ordinance, and it is also subject to AB 1482 for rent increases. That means, according to AB 1482, that rent increases are capped at 5% plus the consumer price index and no greater than 10%. Now the next important date is a static date. It does not change and that's February 1st, 1995. So if a property was built before then, it is no longer subject to AB 1482. It is subject to both of Santa Ana's ordinances. So this is any property built in 
94, 93, 80s, 70s, 60s, any of these properties in Santa Ana are subject to Santa Ana's ordinances. That's both the rent stabilization ordinance and the just cause eviction ordinance. That's an important timeline to understand based on the age of your building, what applies and nothing may apply if it's 15 years or newer, but then if it's older, then you see what applies. So if it's 15 years or newer, nothing applies under these ordinances. But if it's older than that, that's where you have to use a chart like this to figure out exactly what applies and when it applies. This is important for landlords to maintain the exemption. So this would be for an owner of a single family home, condo or townhome. In order to keep their exemption, this would also apply in the case of a landlord who has a multifamily building that's 15 years or newer or matches somewhere on the timeline that we just ran through. So buried in the ordinances is the specific exemption language that's required for each of the ordinances. There's separate language, it's very similar, but separate language for the rent stabilization ordinance and separate language for the just cause eviction ordinance. So it's very important that in order to maintain that exemption that the tenant receives one or both, if, it, if you're exempt from both, receives these in writing in order to maintain that exemption. Now the city, while it has provided a notice to give to the tenants for the case of a property that's subject to the ordinances, the city has not provided any sort of paperwork that reflects this other than what's in the ordinances. We have taken the time to transcribe this and you can copy this from the description below. Make sure you run anything though by your attorney first before you use it. The rent stabilization ordinance caps the amount of increase that a landlord can do for properties subject to the ordinance at a maximum of 3% or 80% of the consumer price index, whichever is lower. So absolute maximum a landlord is going to be able to increase rent is 3%. It could be less. There are cases where rent will not go up 3%, depending on where the consumer price index falls, and it will be 80% of that number. It's important to remember that landlords will only be able to give one increase per year. The maximum rent increase from now until August 30th, 2022 is set at 3%. By June 30th, 2022, the city of Santa Ana will release the next rent increase that will be able to go into effect on September 1st, 2022. Be on the lookout by June 30th, 2022 for that number. And then going forward by June 30th of following years, the city will release the next allowable rent increase. This is the RSO notice that the city has on their website. This is the one from November 19th, 2021. So this theoretically would be the notice that a landlord would give to their tenant if a property is subject to the RSO, it gives a quick outline so tenants understand and it needs a tenant signature at the bottom. Now, one important point is again, make sure you run this by your attorney before giving this to a tenant landlord. But number two, there's something on here that I disagree with and I could be wrong. Let me know in the comments below. But under the tenant rent increase notice requirements, what it says is it's a 60 day notice is required for tenants who've been in place for a year or more. I went through this rent stabilization ordinance several times and I did not see that language. The state of California allows a 30 day notice to be given to a tenant if the increase is less than 10%. So I could be wrong, but again, have your attorneys review this. This may be a mistake on the notice, or there may be some other language in the municipal code that's not in the rent stabilization ordinance. Although I did search the municipal code as well and did not see this. So I am very curious. Let me know in the comments below if you think this is correct on this form. As for the deadline to deliver this to tenants, if you're watching this before December 19th, you have until December 19th, 2021 to deliver this notice to all your tenants in their current tenancy. If you have a tenancy put in place after, you will then deliver this form as part of the lease. So it would be an addendum to the lease for any new tenancies going forward. And this will be used or a form just like this will be used in leases going forward for new tenancies. If a landlord wants to attempt to charge more than the 3% annual increase or whatever it may be set at that point in time, they are able to submit a fair return petition. 
And under Costa Hawkins, a landlord is allowed to receive a fair return. So there's a specific process that's outlined in the ordinance for how a landlord would go about asking for a larger increase. Now it's up to the landlord to cover all costs. The landlord must also notify the tenant that they're doing this and the tenant will have time to respond. The bill does not specify what's considered a fair return. It'll be up to the city manager and the landlord to work together to determine whether they can exceed the allowed increase or not. The Just Cause Eviction Ordinance is a big, huge document that I encourage each of you to download and read, whether you're a landlord or tenant. Now the city does provide a PowerPoint and they have some frequently asked questions, but this document is where the rubber meets the road. There is a lot of information in here and really what needs to happen is landlords, before you move forward with any notice to terminate tenancy, or you move forward with any sort of a notice to cure or quit or notice to quit, make sure you reach out to an attorney who understands Santa Ana specific regulations. And tenants, if you receive anything from a landlord, make sure you reach out to the city for clarification. And I encourage you to reach out to lawhelp.org to find an attorney in the area who understands these ordinances, because there's a lot of moving parts to both of them, but this one <laughs> has a lot more parts. We're gonna do a quick run through. Ultimately, the bill is restricting ways that landlords can terminate tenancies. This is again for properties who are not exempt from the bill. If you're exempt from the bill, you don't need to follow any of this ordinance. But if you're subject to things have dramatically changed for landlords in being able to terminate tenancies. Let's dive in. So the first thing it starts to talk about is delivering the notice. Then it gets into the just cause reasons to terminate a tenancy. So it breaks down into two things. It breaks down into at fault, just cause or no fault, just cause. And by fault, whose fault do I mean? I'm talking about the tenant's fault. So if it's at fault, that means the tenant has done something wrong. And it runs through and it describes the acceptable at fault, just cause reasons. So the easiest way to remember this is somebody's committed a crime, although there's a change in that one. It's also related to committing waste, you're not paying rent, you've breached the terms of the lease. That is all outlined in here. The other way to terminate a tenancy would be no fault, and the tenant hasn't done anything wrong. It's being terminated for one of a few very specific reasons that are outlined in here. So I encourage you to read through this. Again, you're going to need an attorney to help you understand exactly how it applies to your situation, whether you're a landlord or a tenant. Let's dive into no fault. And there are limited reasons a landlord can terminate a tenancy. It essentially breaks down to four different reasons. So number one is if a landlord is going to move in or have a spouse or domestic partner move in, or a parent or grandparent or child or grandchild move in. So that's straight line. Landlords can terminate a tenancy. Going forward for new leases, the language must be in the lease allowing a landlord to terminate a tenancy for this. And it's also going to require that that person stays in the unit for two years in order to qualify for terminating a tenancy under this no fault, just cause reason. Second way would be withdrawal from the rental market, but it's going to require that this is for a minimum of two years and the owner is going to have to sign an affidavit and deliver it to the city stating that they're not going to have it occupied by a tenant for a minimum of two years. The third way is if it's required by a government agency to terminate the tenancy, that would be another way that a landlord could terminate a tenancy through no fault, just cause. And finally, if a landlord intends to demolish the unit or substantially remodel the unit, and by substantially remodel, there's some language in here, must be for health and safety, require permits, you must have to have a tenant out for a minimum of 30 days. That's what the work would require. You can't just be going in to paint and put in new carpet. That would not require a tenant to be moved out for 30 days. Additionally, the landlord, if the work is done within six months, must offer the tenant essentially a first right of refusal to come back to the unit unless they get it in writing that the tenant does not want that. Here's another big difference between AB 1482 and the Santa Ana Just Cause Eviction Ordinance, and that is 
related to relocation assistance. So under AB 1482, a landlord is required to give one month's rent for relocation assistance. The Santa Ana eviction ordinance requires three months rent and for a no fault just cause termination of tenancy. And the landlord has 15 days to either deliver a check for three months worth of rent or let the tenant know in writing that they are waiving three months of rent and in writing have to put how much that dollar amount is. Now this is just for no fault. If the tenant is at fault, a landlord does not owe the relocation assistance. There are certain ways that a tenant can defend against a termination of tenancy. And there's special protections in here for victims of domestic abuse, elder abuse, etc. So it's important as a landlord and a tenant, you understand these special protections in here. An additional protection that's in here under section H states that a tenant could defend against a notice of termination of tenancy if anyone under 21 is registered and attending school during the period that the notice is been given. That's something that landlords should run by their attorneys as well. When given the notice to terminate tenancy, the landlord has to jump through hoops, including making sure it meets the requirements here. And one of those requirements is the city needs a copy of it within five days. And there's other things that are important on here. The notice must be delivered in the language that the lease was negotiated, as well as English, if that was a language that wasn't English. So potentially two versions of the notice. The final section of the bill covers retaliatory evictions and anti-harassment behavior. So behaviors that are considered harassment by landlords. The reason this is included in the bill is that because oftentimes when it's difficult for a landlord to terminate a tenancy, some landlords may turn to behavior that's considered retaliatory or harassment. We saw this actually during the eviction moratorium. We heard a lot of stories where this was the case. So sadly, this sometimes does happen. Now, of course, a good landlord would never turn to this. So make sure you read through this and understand this landlords and tenants so that you know exactly what your rights are and potentially down the road, we will release a video that is specific to these sections because there is a lot in here. Here is the form for the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance and we have links to this below so you can download this form. And I encourage you to read through this because it really breaks down the ordinance. It is required that landlords deliver this to tenants. Same deadline as the one for the rent stabilization. So this must be delivered by December 19th, 2021 for any tenancies in place before before then, and then this must be delivered going forward to tenants. Here's what's unique on this one that says it on the form. This must be delivered in English as well as the language that the lease is negotiated in. The other form, the rent stabilization form, is only required to be delivered in the language that the, that the lease is in. So this you have to give two copies if the lease is in another language. And there are some other sample copies in other languages you can download. This breaks down the bill in an easy to understand format, talks about at fault versus no fault. Let's tenants know they can go to the city's website for more information and that there's special notices required in order to terminate a tenancy. So this is goes into depth on some of the new steps that owners must take in order to terminate a tenancy. This form also has a place to turn for answers, uh, similar to what was on the RSO form. There is a website, email, and phone number. I personally have tried calling the phone number. No one answered, but hopefully at some point in time, they'll get that up to speed so that you can get answers to questions you have, whether you're a tenant or a landlord. Again, I encourage you as a landlord and as a tenant to download this and review this. Leave your questions below on the Santa Ana Rent Stabilization Ordinance and Just Cause Eviction Ordinance. Let us know any other topics you'd like to see covered under the ordinance and we'll make a video about it. Make sure you subscribe to our free weekly email newsletter. We'll keep updates on this ordinance and a whole lot more. Thanks for tuning in. This has been Christian Walsh, real estate agent with Wire Associates, and we appreciate you.